John Hurt stayed with us. Uh, I had two roommates. He stayed in our apartment for almost a week um, because they didn't have anywhere to go until the, the next gig. He and Dick Waterman both stayed with us. <laughs> um, and he did the show. He did a concert. It was wonderful. If you look on the back of his second Vanguard album, there's a story that Waterman wrote the notes and there's a story about him being paid. And that took place after this concert. My friend David, this is how I know it was 66. David was the president of the Folklore Society. So he wrote and signed the checks. So David opened the book and wrote the check to John and handed it to John. And John looked at the check and he looked at David and he said, could you give me one of your checks instead? And David said, well, I guess I could, John, but you know, this is a University of Chicago check, the University of Chicago. And John smiled as he would, and he, he looked at David and he said, yes, but I don't know the University of Chicago. I do know you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So David wrote him a personal check. <laughs> <laughs> so when he so then he stayed with you guys for a week so what how you know what was that week like yeah what was it like john just sat around and played guitar and word got around we the people who liked this kind of thing or went to the concert that john hurt was staying with us and i can picture him sitting in a chair and a semicircle of students and hangers on and proto hippies and whatever stoned and looking out up at him on the floor in admiration and him just singing away and playing guitar and telling stories and that's mostly went on for that week i don't remember really much more of the details waterman reminded me that during this period there was a big blackout that affected chicago this might have been the big blackout that went all the way from new york through to the midwest and he and dick and john went out to buy candles to light so we would have some light Oh, okay. Um, that's pretty much all I remember, except for it might have been after, I think it was after the concert, we had a party. This was, this is something I don't know. I don't think uh, this still goes on. I know it doesn't go on in, in a lot of places, but it was always the case that if there was a folk music concert, there was a party afterwards. And the people who put on the concert, and their friends and anybody else who can, could finagle their way in went to the party. So we had a party after the John Hurt concert. And John was sitting and we had one funky old um, overstuffed chair that was kind of sort of comfortable maybe. And he was sitting in that, in this one room, just sitting there and there were people wandering in and out and it was full of smoke and people were, doing what people did back then. And we're in all states of consciousness and unconsciousness. Unconscious and who should walk in? Dick Waterman walks in with Sun House. He's carrying a little paper bag. It's pretty obvious what's in the paper bag. He walks to the other side of the room. It wasn't a terribly big room. Facing John, there's a little bit of a table sort of coffee table, he steps up on the table and he takes a swig from whatever it was that was inside the bag. And he looks around <laughs> and he starts preaching. Just as soon you as know, he walked in? Pretty much, as I recall. Okay. You know, this is oral history. Right. So uh, not, not going to swear to it in a court of law, but as I recall, he stood on the table, pretty sure that I know John was sitting in that chair. And I know that he had, that son had the paper bag that he was helping himself to, the contents of. And he started preaching. He had been a preacher. He, like a, quite a few other of the older blues players, you know, there's this Saturday night, Sunday morning conflict. Saturday night is, is the uh, juke joint night, the blues night, and Sunday is church. And the blues and church, they don't mix, <laughs> you know? And there were performers like, or people like Sun, who was a pretty tormented person. I think, for whatever reasons, uh, went back and forth in their lives between being um, derelict bluesmen, the devil's men, and being preachers. 
Right. Well, this night he was in a preaching phase. Okay. <laughs> and he stood on this table and he started preaching fire and brimstone and blah, blah, blah. And heavy Southern accent. He was drunk, very hard to understand. Uh, the place becomes dead silent. <laughs> All these young people in various states of uh, consciousness, unconsciousness, <laughs> looking up at him with wide eyes and amazement. And he's going on and on. And across the room, sitting in the in this you know funky old uh, overstuffed chair is Mississippi John Hurt. And he's just looking up at, at Sunhouse and beaming and saying, that's right, son. That's right. <laughs> you tell him, son. That's right. That's my big memory from, wow. from Mississippi John Hurt. So he, he was the one that really got it in the room. He got it. And it was to me, to me, Sunhouse, if I may get a little academic for a moment, sure. just a moment. Um, he represented what Nietzsche called the Dionysian side of things. That is the, 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 the wild, the chaotic, the drunken side of things. No holds barred. Uh, John was the Apollonian side of things. This was a distinction that Nietzsche made in, in um, The Birth of Tragedy. The tragedy, Greek tragedy grew out of the intersection of these two things, the Dionysian and the Apollonian, the god Apollo, which was calm and peaceful and thoughtful and taking everything in and not jumping to conclusions and not acting under the influence of alcohol. So we, here we had these two, this was very exciting wow. to me intellectually. Uh, <laughs> as a somewhat philosophy student. And, uh, but it was extraordinary. I mean, you couldn't have had a greater contrast between two people, but yes, John got it. You know, right.